Good morning. I hope you survived the party, at least uh, everybody who is here. Um, my name is Todd Weidemann and uh, I want to uh, present you uh, a little bit uh, of information and food for thought uh, before you even start your project or in the early phases where actually most of my clients are doing their mistakes. Uh, a couple of words who I am. Um, I'm in the game industry for over 30 years now. Um, I'm doing this a really long time. It's the only thing I can do, meaning that I have no other choice, but you all know it's the best industry to be in. Um, I should over 100 titles on various platforms, I lost count. Uh, I did nearly every job you are doing in the industry. I was an artist, programmer, I ran my own development company for 10 years. I was CEO of a public company. And for 10 years now, I'm consulting uh, clients in free-to-play and online game design. Um, and some of my clients you can see here. So you see some of the big ones, some of the medium ones, some smaller ones. Um, so uh, they rely on my expertise in certain combinations of game design itself with free-to-play monetization. Um, I added some Polish companies here as well. Uh, there are a couple of them are missing because not everybody are allowing me to list them here. Um, but uh, uh, you might uh, see Artifacts Mundi Game Bizarre and Vivid Games as well. Um, what I want to talk about is audience in relation to free-to-play. As you know, free-to-play scales by size, by audience size. So if you have 1 million players and 100 million players, the difference is, is really big. But rarely a developer, when they design their game, um, actually is considering their audience size. You know, they say, oh, this, this genre, you know, I'm having fun with, let's do a free-to-play game with this, and at this graphic and setting. Um, and they don't think about audience size at all. And uh, that's uh, something I would love to change in your head. Um, you, you have seen these numbers, how the global market is actually growing. Um, the interesting thing is not that it is growing. The interesting question is, where is it growing? So, so where is that growth? Do we play more games in Poland, in Germany? I doubt that. You know, we are still playing as many games as before. So this growth is usually kicked by new territories. So we added India as a huge territory. South America is growing and growing. You know, even Africa is growing now in terms of free-to-play games. Uh, the MENA region, um, you know, many new regions are actually actively gaming and spending money there. And this is where that growth comes from. And the question I shoot to you is that, do you know how South American players play your game? Do you know how Africans play such a game or Indians? You don't know because you don't know the culture. It might be alien to you. Um, and uh, that's kind of interesting because if you don't design your game in a way that they actually like it, you're actually missing out this 1.x billion market of India, for example. <coughs> and uh, you see here uh, that uh, Asia, Asia Pacific is uh, basically half of the world's gaming market now. So if you want to increase your reach and your financial revenue, you should learn how these markets work. China is very complicated to learn, um, and it's a market which is not as easy to penetrate, but there are a lot of countries around that which are uh, good for, for reach and monetization, uh, which is uh, a little bit easier. Um, so when you put money aside, um, the, the main topic I would love to talk about is the difference of your audience in terms of age, gender, the genre preference they have, the visual style preferences they have, the visual cultivation, how I uh, call it, um, and the game market history, because the game market history in each country has an impact how people actually play games. Um, and that's these parameters are basically influencing your potential reach you have with your game. So the narrower the reach is for you, the more difficult it is for you to make money and the more difficult it is for your marketing to actually reach these users. And you know, let's go step by step through these, uh, um, through these points. So age and gender. Um, this is um, a rough market segmentation I did from the data I had access to. Um, and you see that uh, in America, most gamers are 35 and older. It's the oldest game market we have, uh, so that it's natural that you know, their average age is older. That means if you try to, uh, to reach America with a game which is for 13-year-old kids, you will have a hard time because most of their gamers are actually much older. It also means that Twitchy games, which are action-like, do less well in America than someplace else because their games are older and older players usually don't play that. But on the contrast, you see on the, in South America, uh, they're actually younger than 26 and are very male-oriented. 
Uh, Europe is kind of five years behind America in terms of age, but the distribution is kind of similar. And then you have the younger markets here, which are all younger than 26 and very male dominated. Um, and this is kind of important. I will get to that point on the next slide. Um, then you have uh, Australia, which is very, very similar to the UK in terms of demographics. No wonder it's an ex-colony from them. Um, and then you have a kind of oddity, which is Japan. Japan is the only country in the world where they have more female gamers than male gamers. Uh, their kind of game history also is vastly different. So when I when I categorize this, you know, we basically get uh, uh, three main groups with a kind of oddity in here, and uh, we can put that together into uh, these four groups you can target. So when you make a game, and uh, the game is usually played by younger people, you should make sure that it actually is compatible to South America, Arabic markets, Russia, Africa, and the Asian ones. Of course, you will find younger gamers in the other ones as well, but in terms of global population, most of these gamers, 13-year-old gamers, are actually there. <coughs> now, when you, when you add age and gender together, you will have a certain genre preference. Um, there's a really interesting resource here, uh, which is on Quantic Foundry. It's a website I usually recommend for any game-related research. You see that with age, the readiness of competitiveness in a game actually is dropping. So when you're really young, you know, you love competition. And with competition, I mean PvP, direct confrontation with other players. The older you get, the less likely it is. That means in the Western market, if you have a 35-year-old gamer, like in the US, they don't like PvP. Contrary to what you see in the App Store, like, oh, you see Fortnite, it's PvP. Synchronous, it's Clash Royale, PvP, you all see this, but this is like the peaks hitting a certain market segment. This is not hitting the large market segment. Um, so when you want to address the 35-year-old gamer, PvP should be optional, it should not be a must. This is hard to swallow for everybody who's doing Synchronous PvP games or Clash Royale clones, but uh, there's enough data to actually confirm this. So generally you see that the younger your audience is, the more action and PvP they like, uh, the older they are, the more strategy and PvE they like, the more male-oriented your audience is, the more action and PvP they like, so that's very compatible with younger, um, and uh, more female means casual and PvE. Uh, it's very an uh, easy categorization, male-female, it's much more complex than this, um, but this is kind of the, the easy table, um, how we can talk about that. Um, there's excellent uh, research about this, the male-female split by genre. Uh, so you see that sports and shooters are male dominant, uh, over 90%. Uh, Combat city building all the way up to matching puzzle simulation, casino, brain puzzle and physics puzzles actually uh, female dominated. Um, so theoretically, when you say I'm doing a tower defense game, you see that you have up to 30% female audience. And that means that you have to cater this audience, otherwise they don't play your game, so you lose reach, so you make less money. Um, so theoretically now you can make a, a table with gender, age and genre, three dimensions, and put your game in it, like, oh, we do this game with this genre and uh, um, at this setting, and then you actually know which audience you address. And what does that mean for your game? If you know that audience, you know their visual habits, you know their, their gaming habits, and you can cater the game better to that audience. But there's of course more. The problem is not as simple as I just said. Um, the, the history matters as well. So when we, when we take the, the European countries um, uh, and the Americas, um, we actually grew up with arcade games, you know, the games where you put in you know, money and then played them. Uh, and then came the home computer and PC, which taught us most of our gaming. Um, and then came the console and dominated the market, at least in Western markets. And then we have the PC online gaming, which you know, boosted up the MMORPGs, the Counter-Strikes and God knows what. Uh, and uh, since a couple of years, we have smartphones. So this is our gaming history, how we grew up in terms of gaming. Now, here's the interesting thing. In Japan, they invented arcade, so they grew up with arcade games. And then actually came console. They're skipping the step home computer and PC. What does that mean for Japanese gamers? For Japanese gamers, it means they don't know how to play MMORPGs. They don't know how to play Counter-Strike. They never encountered the internet gaming like we did, because they don't have PC as a market. The reason is really simple. Why? Uh, sim because at home they don't have room for PC. 
when we have a PC, we have an extra desk, you know, with screen and PC and stuff in our work environment. Uh, the Japanese people are living in a different condition, meaning that they their whole family is in a really small uh, um, um, apartment uh, and they don't have room for a PC. That was the primary reason why the console dominated the Japanese market, because it fit underneath the normal TV they had. But can you imagine that if you forget everything you learned on PC gaming, interface, the habits, the immersion, the style, technology, everything, and would then make a game how different that game would be. That is the reason why Japanese games look and feel different than ours, because they don't have a PC market. And to the extreme, we have China and South Korea, um, who didn't have arcade, who didn't have PC online gaming, uh, uh, the, the PC single player market, who didn't have any console, they started their game market with online PC gaming. So they couldn't afford PCs at home, they were really, really expensive compared to their average income. And they went in, in with their friends to internet cafes and played there, and by default they played online games. Together as a team of friends against other teams of friends. That's the reason why in China, MMORPGs, all online games are highly competitive and PvP games and it's a really young audience as well. Um, so they don't know anything about consoles, home computers, arcades, and you know the, the habits and user uh, uh, interface um, patterns we, we are using there. And now, of course, China is one of the biggest smartphone markets here in terms of games as well. Uh, one of the most successful games of all time, uh, including all the games we ever did, uh, is actually coming from China. Do you know what game I'm talking about? The most valuable IP we have worldwide and I, I bet most of you haven't played that. It's called Arena of Valor. Arena of Valor is a big League of Legends on mobile and it's making so much money that it basically dwarfs the, the competition. Um, you can research some of the numbers, it's from Tencent. So the other good thing what we have is that mobile actually added a really um, uh, older player base to, the, to, to gaming, plus increased the female audience tremendously. Before mobile hit the market, the female market was really small, so one, one third. We had games like uh, more RPGs, like World of Warcraft, they had like 30% female and everybody was really, yay, you know, we have more females than usual, meaning that we need to make more business. <coughs> but you can see compared to P the PC market and the console pa market, that the, the mobile market is actually older, older than you think. Because many developers think smartphone games, mobile games are actually played by kids. This is not true. Most gamers, and specifically most payers, are really, really old. And I mean they're much older than you are. You know, most, well, some exceptions here, but you know, most of your players are older than you are, meaning that whatever you think is a good game might not match for them. So you have to learn their patterns, right? That's one of the reasons why strategy games dominate the charts as well, and role-playing games, and turn-based games, and you know, all that. <coughs> So, when you take all this insight together about gender, genre preferences, and all the rest, um, we can basically make a strategic positioning of your title. So, if you tell me if your game supports PvP or uh, uh, PvP uh, mainly, <coughs> if it's action or strategy, uh, and what genre it has, I can guess roughly a reach, a category, like is it a reach category A, B, or C. Um, and then we can actually pick countries which match your audience. And we know what age that will be, <coughs> what the male-female distribution is, and what setting you have. That's the next interesting thing, right? So your genre and PvP, PvE, etc. is defining something, which countries are strongest. And because we know how these countries are, are consuming visuals from experience, from Hollywood, from movies, from a lot of other things, we know what setting is compatible. And this is now the hardest pill to swallow for you because the graphic style and setting is the one thing most developers don't think about. It has to look good. This is like the first thing they, they say. Uh, their creative director or their lead artist you know, has this graphic style for their game and this is like the main theme that he wants to push without knowing that the wrong setting and graphic style to a really good game can make you destroy it. This is a key lesson uh, you should learn here from this session. So just a couple of examples. We have here typical female heroines from China, Korea and America. And you already see that there is a visual difference between these three. Um, 
between China and South Korea, it doesn't, you know, for the Western eye, they, they actually look identical, but actually for the Asian eye, they are vastly different. If you ask a Chinese guy, you know, what this is, he will immediately pinpoint this, you know, this Chinese or oh, this is South Korean crap. They beg you what the Chinese guy says. When you ask a South Korean guy, you know, he says, yeah, yeah, this is a hearing from this movie and blah, blah, etc., you know, and uh, this is kind of, you know, the, the censored Chinese version. So there's this kind of competition going on. But for us, you know, it's the same. Now, this we can identify. Um, and it even goes further, right? Um, so let's categorize that. The Chinese have a style which is influenced heavily by their mythology. They don't know Lord of the Rings fantasy or high fantasy. We have, they have their own version of fantasy um, called Seven Kingdoms. Um, science fiction is niche in China. Um, they have a really serious uh, graphic style, heavily influenced by the martial arts style. Um, and uh, often we in the West, as stupid as we are, uh, mix up uh, their style with manga. But this is of course a huge mistake because manga and anime is Japanese. Do the Chinese people like the Japanese? Historically, no, because the Japanese killed a lot of Chinese in, a, in the dark history, meaning that uh, the older a Chinese gamer is, the more he hates the Japanese. But you know, I'm generalizing, okay, with my with my really naive way of seeing history. Um, now in South Korea, it's a little bit different. Uh, they have a very realistic, very clean style. Uh, they have oversex characters, so they you know their females, the best armor is already they have nothing on. This is like how Korea loves their female characters. Um, while cleavage in China is not allowed, so all the women are walking around like you know close um, with uh, with long um, sleeves. Um, they have their own mythology. We mix it up with the Chinese one. But uh, whenever you see a monkey king, you know this kind of ape with a with a stick. Uh, this is actually a South Korean god. It's not a Chinese one, um, and that's how you can actually identify this. <coughs> so, but nevertheless, Korean style is somewhat compatible with China. That's the reason why there are some giants, uh, free-to-play companies in South Korea, which dominate China as well, uh, because they know how to enter that market due to the compatibility. Now in America, fantasy is the second most literature they have. For Americans, fantasy is a really serious literature business. So if you try to humor them in their fantasy, you're not doing good. So what do you think is the first most read literature in the US? in America, if fantasy is number two. No. L unfortunately not. You're cheating, yes. Yeah, it's romance. It's love and romance is number one. Number two is fantasy. Um, so <laughs> Americans don't like you to humor their fantasy. So when you try to do that, you know, you might actually offend uh, American graphic style. Um, <coughs> they like a more serious, realistic style. You know, for me, you know, think of Game of Thrones. This is basically how their high fantasy look like, or Lord of the Rings. Um, the reason here is that fantasy is really old in the USA. Uh, it has been made popular by uh, by Tolkien uh, in 1964 among the students. Very interesting story, by the way, how that happened. And since then, all America is uh, fantasy. <coughs> I always um, uh, look at Japan as the oddity because they invented manga and anime. Um, they have some really odd animals for the Western audience in their games. Some cute stuff we have, you know, like a flying rat on a tail as a balloon. We have no idea where that came from. The Japanese know where this comes from. So for us, it's even harder to enter the Japanese market because it's so odd. Um, for them, also, the fantasy sci fi mix is okay. They have no, you know, if you look at Final Fantasy, you know, they fire guns, they have spaceships, they have fantasy monsters, everything. Um, but on the other hand, Japan is the oldest game market in Asia. It has been hugely successful since they reinvented the console. Um, but the market in Japan is heavily influenced uh, by the console history, and this includes controls and everything. Um, now, when you see um, uh, the American realistic style, um, this is kind of the, the obvious way to go. Um, if you look at this style, did you see the obvious difference here? Just look at the colors. So there's a lot of gray and brown in this. And this is a very typical graphic style for, for Eastern Europe. So they somehow tend to go 
you know, gray and brown. Uh, but where they should go is actually, you know, they should actually go more to the American side. Now in Korea, you immediately see the difference. You know, I, I, I picked extreme images for this, okay? But just I wanted to make a, th a point. You see the over six characters. Um, uh, you see that they have some really odd animals in the character mix as well. Um, they somehow love cat eyes, uh, like humanoid cats. And a lot of other things, um, meaning that someone who loves Asia and Asian games immediately knows this is a South Korean game, a Chinese game, or a Japanese game. <coughs> now, compared to China, uh, you see that they are kind of historical costumes. They fit their heroines in, uh, and you also see that compared to the oversex characters here, you know that that they are kind of you know covered most of their skin, uh, and this is very typical um, uh, Chinese. Uh, one side note: in uh, in Chinese games, you're not allowed to have skeletons. No, just one small little thing you have to learn if you want to enter that market. And then we have the, the odd mar uh, you know, <laughs> this is Japanese fantasy characters from some of their most popular games. Uh, w does anyone know uh, where these characters are from? It's like from the most successful game of all time in Japan? Yes, Puzzle and Dragons. Um, one of the first games who actually reached over a billion uh, in revenue, just in Japan. Um, and then they have this. So this is why Japan is a very odd country because we just don't get what the hell is going on. You know, this is their fantasy. This is their fantasy as well. Um, so when you want to enter Japan with your game, uh, be in for a surprise. Uh, I bet that without a partner in Japan who teaches you the local culture, uh, you might not succeed. And the devil is in the detail, right? In the West, everybody knows this guy, right? From Conan the Barbarian, the, this is the fantasy hero, uh, I guess, since he appeared in the um, in the movies. Uh, in the West, heroes are of middle age, male, very strong, like the V shape. Um, our health bar in our games is green. Um, our color of death mostly is black. Um, we like smaller numbers, and our we have this number psychology because we are reading left to right. Uh, actually, 9.99 is actually less than 10. Euro in our mind a lot less simply because you know our reading habits and the, our rating in the school system I don't know how it's in Poland is actually one to six with one being the best six being the worst some countries have five to one I don't know which one does Poland follow in in school so six is the highest one is the worst okay see uh, but this is like how we rate um, now in Asia this is the hero usually Asian heroes are very young most of them are teens, 16, 17 year old, very slim, like you know, not even you know muscles. Um, their health bar is red because for them life means blood. Um, their color of death, depending on country, is either black or white. Um, they love large numbers compared to us. So you know when we hit someone for 90 damage, they want to see like two million damage. This is when you play Asian games, you see these large numbers popping up everywhere. And the larger the numbers are, the cooler it is. This, you know, for them, this is like cool. Uh, when we see a game where you, the maximum level you can reach is 1,000, we don't play the game because we say 1,000 levels. Are they crazy? I'm never going to spend that much time in this. The Chinese love that. Level 1,000 for them means more content, means you know they actually enter the game. That's how different it is. And if you see at their school rating, you know they have A, B, C, S double S and triple S as the best one. And you see this in many Asian games now. Actually, the Western audience is now educated that this Asian system is like the norm. This is like the bad thing I see. Uh, because when you, when you ask kids or the young audience and they play Asian games, you know, and they see this, for them it's a, it's a normal thing now that this is kind of a rating system. For us, it's a really alien one. <coughs> Female heroes. In China, surprisingly, female heroes are very common, thanks to the Hong Kong and, and uh, the Hong Kong uh, heritage. But in South Korea and, and uh, Japan, there are no female heroes in movies. Zero, nil, none. You can, good luck finding some, but that's surprising. So if you make a game where the hero is female, good luck entering these markets. Because they're not used to it. For them, the savior of the world is always a man. Um, but you know, uh, this is like from one of my favorite movies, but I don't know, D does anyone know this actress? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love you, it's so cool. No, but it's, it's really rarely people actually uh, identify her and know her name, but that's okay. Now, in the West, we are used to female heroes, you know, Tomb Raider and all that stuff, and you know, uh, here from, uh, from Horizon, the game, so for us it's okay. Another difference, right? 
if you have a female hero, some markets are suddenly closed for you. So some key learnings and some key examples here. Um, there you go through. First thing, and I'm, I'm not underestimating, you know, this slide can save your game. First thing is, if genre setting defines age and gender, you should p put care into these decisions. Don't hastily do these decisions where you say, we're doing a strategy game with little cute elf characters and the graphics are like, you know, half nude. Just that, put some things on the map which adds or subtracts markets for you or players. Um, how you can test this? You can test it with focus grouping. Focus group means that in every major market you identified, usually the US, some, uh, some of them in Europe, um, you can get focus group tests and test that against your age group. Do they really like what they see or not? Uh, and that's you know, not that expensive to actually use. There are online services uh, uh, who do that for you. Now, if genre and setting define the key territories, you should educate yourself about these territories' habits. Believe me, even me who spent dozens, not dozens, but you know, a long time with, to understand the American player, still for me, America is not really transparent in terms of what works and what doesn't. I'm a little bit better educated than most, maybe, because, you know, I, for me, America is one of the most important markets here. But on the other hand, it's really tough to understand America by itself. And you see that, you know, on the current president. Um, yes, I just mentioned Trump in my talk. Um, so what the fuck did they think about this? We have no idea. You know, we are like, oh my god, they're so stupid. But on the other hand, hey, it's the biggest market. So how can we leverage this knowledge for our games? We develop in Poland, in Germany, in the UK, in Scandinavia to actually understand the Americans. So the first thing is, you know, don't look in the games charts only. Look in the book charts and the movie charts and, you know, a lot of things to learn what Americans like and what they don't like, if you want to enter that. And you have to learn that some matches don't work. So let's see some examples. Um, very premium Belarus title. World of Tanks is something, you know, which Bakey redefined what Wargaming is. It's a billion dollar company now. This is the one game. So, first thing, World of Tanks is a core audience. We know that. It's World War II. It's PvP. PvP means male, young audience, right? So, what they thought about is that if we have the Twitchy audience, 17 to 26, which is the key area, how can we change the game or adapt the game to actually address some older gamers as well? Why won't they do this? Because the older people are, the more money they have. So what they put in is that they have roles in the game which are suited for older players like me. So the first thing is artillery. Artillery sits in the corner and you can make, you know, shoot on the map. So there's no action involved. It's just tactics and strategy. Second, super heavy tanks. Super heavy tanks, you know, someone can shoot at me 10 times, I still don't die. So, you know, I'm kind of comfortable with that and I can learn positioning. And in this game, thinking, matches um, their reaction. Of course, they have medium tanks and scout tanks, which are really, really fast for the young players. But on the other hand, they made a really good job in trying to understand what age group prefers what style in action gameplay and try to support everything like this. And, you know, uh, it actually worked really well for them. Overwatch is my favorite title to talk about when it comes to diversification, both in graphic style worldwide and in game style. All the characters, the heroes in this game, if you put them all side by side and you take them and you go to America and say, which one do you think is coolest? They will point to this, 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 this. You go to Germany, something will happen that is similar. I go to Poland and you will say, oh, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool. You can go to Russia, you can go to China to South Korea, to Japan, to every single country in this world, everybody will find a hero or two he thinks, oh, this looks really, really cool. So how did they do this? It's a really interesting topic. How did they create a graphic style which is completely unique, but still addresses the whole world? So this is one of my role models there. Besides the fact that they have classes in the game for older players like me, I have a problem doing headshots, simply because my eyes are not as good as yours and my coordination not anyway. But here they come and they have characters with auto-aim. 
Now this is really cool. I don't need to aim. I just need to strategically put my skills into effect. So this is another thinking. Why, uh, why is Overwatch so successful? This is exactly the reason. They thought about how can I widen the reach of the normal shooter genre. Don't rely on the 13-year-old teen to play the game. Rely on a whole broader audience to actually do this. The same applies to Cl uh, Clash uh, Royale and Clash of Clan. Did you ever wonder why Supercell abstracted their Viking setting? We all know it's a Viking game, right? Sort of. It could be historically accurate Viking graphics, but it isn't. Why is that? Simply because there are people out there who don't like the Viking setting to play. They don't like that. So they will never touch these Supercell games. There are people who love the Viking setting and who play this game. But you know, how do they overlap? What do, what do you lose? So what they did is they abstracted the Viking setting abstracted it so that people who don't like the Viking setting still think it's an attractive setting and they go in. It, it doesn't overrule the, the, the game itself, so to say. Um, and the Viking fans still find Viking characters in the game itself. Um, this is basically why they abstracted the setting. The reason is not that mobile cannot do complex graphics. The reason is not that they wanted to address kids. This is wrong. Everybody who sees the graphics thinks this is how mobile games should look like. That's not the case. There are plenty of examples in the mobile space that no, don't do cute graphics until you know what you're looking at or what you're doing, okay? Just warning. Summoner's War, one of my other favorite examples um, is one of the rare occurrences where an Asian RPG game is hugely successful in the West. They do 60% of the revenue in overseas. In they're overseas, right, outside of South Korea. And the reason is that they're the vast number of characters they have give characters to just everyone. They have World of Warcraft style characters in there, they have Asian style characters in there, so everybody finds characters he actually likes, so that makes the game very compatible with the world itself. Besides the fact that RPG is really successful worldwide. Another really good example. Match three RPGs were not successful in the past five years, until recently. I come to that. The reason is, Match 3 is played mostly by females, 60%, 35 years and older. This is the core audience. Now, if you have a 35 year and older audience, plus you add an RPG on top, you're even adding age to this group. Now, this group is old, has different visual habits, and you present them this graphic. This is not what an adult wants to play. He wants serious graphics, high fantasy, you know, what he grew up with. And see there, there are actually two games which exactly did that. So Empires and Puzzles, high fantasy, Mad Street Combat, it's very similar to this game, you know, perfect execution, and they have high fantasy graphics. And this game is tremendously successful. Unbelievable numbers. I've seen the numbers. It's like, you know, I'm really jealous about them. And they're growing like crazy. So this game is a role model for how should have the Match 3 RPG genre, you should have done that. Not like this, like this. And the second one is actually uh, not using Match 3, but Blackjack, but this is really successful as well, and they have the high fantasy setting as well. What is that? This is a mobile game from Asia. This is an MMORPG. The latest trend since three years, that's how old it is. They port full-fledged PC MMORPG experiences to mobile. That's what they do. And everybody in the West thought this is not going to work. A year later, the, all the Asian charts are dominated by MMORPGs. And see there, bit by bit, these games are coming here in the West and we have a couple of MMORPGs not dominating the charts as well. So yes, core games are here, and we all saw that in Fortnite and, and other things, but MMORPGs are actually dominating uh, the, the monetization now. Uh, this is Westward Journey, one of the most valuable IPs in China uh, in terms of fantasy. You can Google this. What do you think? Yeah, you're laughing, but the developer was really serious shipping this. So it's a classic point-and-click adventure game, and this is the graphic style. I have no idea what drugs he took, um, but for us, for every one of us, this is obvious that it doesn't work, right? But for him, you know, he thought it's the most wonderful idea ever. Um, so be careful with the genre to graphic setting, right? Um, it's a very yeah, obvious fail here. Um, 
Someone said sci-fi is, you know, the, the most read literature. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, but uh, let's look at what sci-fi means. You know, you have here uh, ships flying, sci-fi, uh, space legend. Um, science fiction fans are even older than fantasy fans. And science fiction fans expect really serious environment and characters. They don't expect kiddie like comic graphics with their spaceships. Key lesson here, space grognard, Star Wars fans, 50 years old, they want real spaceships. They don't want comic stuff. Okay, so when do when you do a sci-fi game, better go the down the serious route. Um, I'm I still have a couple of minutes. Um, this is an MMORPG, which was a really interesting experiment because an Austrian company um, reskit a Korean company uh, with a different graphic style. So they have like this kind of modern pixel style here, uh, which I think uh, uh, was was a good move compared to the Asian one. But on the other hand, if you look at the Asian one, it actually looks so much better. So even though it's it's kind of manga anime oriented, uh, this game looks more serious in style than actually this one. It's identical game. The content is completely identical, but it's just uh, the graphic style they try to adapt. Um, this game is pretty successful in Korea. Outside of Korea, it's not successful. This game, actually, they shut down after three months operation because it just simply didn't carry it. Um, but for me, it's a very interesting comparison between the Legacy Quest game, which is the Austrian company rescanning it, and uh, the Fantasy War Tactics from Nexon. Um, because whenever people do this IB testing, for me, it's interesting which country actually picks up what. You remember when uh, um, PUBG came and all the Battle Royale games, uh, NetEase shipped three games at once, three Battle Royale games which seemed to be identical, but for them it was a big A-B test of the world. Uh, and it's really interesting which, which country actually picked which version because there are subtle differences in there and you could learn a lot about the habits of each country by uh, following the charts here. Um, this is uh, w the one of the most successful strategy titles uh, from an Israel company called Plarium um, in, the, in the Viking Age. Um, and what they have done is reskin the game to a lot of settings. Actually, there are so many settings that you might lose track. So this game is nearly identical between all these. There are subtle differences for, for the setting itself, but they have a fantasy setting, a medieval setting, they have a, a mythical setting, a sci-fi setting, one of the official Terminator license, I just forgot the other ones. But what they found out is that when they actually reskin that game, that they actually widen the audience. They don't cannibalize the market. Simply because there are people, hey, strategy game, in fantasy, I love that. And there are people who say, oh, not again, I, you know, I don't, I don't like orcs and elves anymore. I've just seen too much. But I would love to have that in sci-fi. So they're offering their game in all the settings you know, the world likes. And for them, that works really, really well. So that's another thing you know you might think about to make your game reskinnable for certain settings. This is, I think, the Terminator version here with official Schwarzenegger as uh, as, a, as a lead. Um, so this is another lesson I learned: is that reskinning is not a bad thing when you can widen your audience um, in in certain markets. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope I could help a little bit making your next decision of your game a little bit wiser so that you don't fail in the beginning with picking the wrong setting for the right genre but the wrong target audience. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Any questions? Hi, hello. Um, I'm very much interested in like localization and stuff. And I actually did a panel about uh, how to localize uh, games for China and Japan because it's a, a bit of my interest. And I'm wondering, because I r literally think that it's a matter of people's mentality that we still don't realize how different it is for the people to see your game from their yeah. own perspective. So. Uh, do you think that maybe we should work more with like companies in game dev, like showing them that um, that those things are really important? It's not just the language, the clothes, and mm -hmm. everything. Because I I literally have this feeling that people it's like with marketing. People don't think about marketing, but this is a big topic right now. So mm. we're talking about it, but people don't talk much about how 
um, important it is to have all these details yeah. and that you can do just a small thing but it can like literally change like um, the, the, the most uh, I mean you can add like a little thing to your game that can make a massive difference what I mean but it's I think it's a mindset that needs to change in a game dev so that people could realize how to do well, that, I think so. We are living uh, in the global game yeah. market, so we have to learn about globalization. Um, that means that we have to learn how alien cultures work. So if you, if you have the ability to send your game designer for two or four weeks to Japan, just do it, or to China or wherever, you know, because he will learn the, the, the culture if he's open-minded and he will radically change his view how the gaming market works. Um, you know, when you ever entered a Chinese uh, internet cafe and played with Chinese gamers, you know, uh, they're really friendly about that, uh, you will suddenly see, uh, oh my God, you know, we are like years behind the Chinese. This is like the first impression you get. But you learn how they play their patterns and you know, a lot of other things. Um, so it's really important in my mind to travel, uh, to be open-minded about the world. Um, uh, you know, le leave your city as often as you can and, you know, try to encounter different civilizations uh, because that will tremendously help actually making your game more successful. Um, if your team are, let's say, in Poland, are all Polish people who never left Poland, you will have a really, really hard time, you know, competing in the, in the global market. Um, so I'm also all in for international teams, so, you know, that you have all races, genders and, you know, sexes, just, you know, throw them into one team and that helps that as well. Yeah. So it's part of HR. Thanks. Okay, so my question is, um, do you think, that you say that sci-fi and comics don't work for the older people, they don't match. So do you think these are the trends or is it more or less a constant? Like in 50 years, is it going to change those? those uh it, it always changes, but it changes really slowly. Uh, did you know that anime uh, and manga are actually really popular in France? In France, it's one of the top most read literatures, but just in France. In the rest of Europe, it, we see manga and anime as a kid's topic. But it isn't. So this, this Japanese culture who love anime and manga, whose order is actually growing now since a couple of years, but they haven't reached a critical mass yet. Now, if I say sci-fi is for older users, um, it all depends what Disney does to Star Wars or what you know the next big TV series might be. Um, so if Star Wars will be bigger than Lord of the Rings, it isn't. Uh, you know, there might be a huge sci-fi wave coming as well. But uh, at the moment, uh, try to find me a science fiction game in the App Store which is successful. It's really tough really hard. Um, and there are reasons for this. Uh, and if you understand the reasons, you can actually battle them and still go down that route. But you have to understand the reasons first. Um, and the same applies to all the fantasy settings or, you know, why should you pick a cute style for your game? Should you pick one or not? The, the current trend is you should not, because everybody is cute. Because the problem is how to stand out in the in the mass of, of games out there. And the first thing which, which you have to stand out is your graphic style. So the compromise between targeting your audience and making a graphic style which stands out, you know, is the hardest decision you can make. And uh, good luck finding an art director who understands that and uh, can actually create this art style. These people are rare. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye, have a nice day.